Good morning. It is a delight uh, to see you uh, this morning as we are uh, here to, uh, to celebrate in a special way uh, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, this morning to prepare our hearts uh, for worship, uh, we will have an extra prelude, otherwise known as an introit, uh, to, to prepare ourselves uh, to worship uh, our great uh, God. Consider uh, as we uh, hear, as we uh, prepare, uh, that indeed, as Job declared, I know that my Redeemer lives, so indeed he does in Jesus Christ.
Please stand for our call to worship. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Let's go to God in prayer. Now, great and almighty God and Father, we do give our praise to you. We praise you, O God, for the Lord Jesus Christ, who was dead and is now alive. We give you thanks, O God, that by his life we too might live, because in his death we too have died to sin and to death and to the devil. We give you thanks, O oh God, that as you raise us to new life, so you give us lips that are loosened to sing your praise. We pray, O oh God, that you would now, by the power of your Spirit, uh, fill us, that our, our, our praises would be to the praise of your glorious grace. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray these things. Amen. 
This morning we affirm our faith using uh, an adaptation from the uh, Scotch Confession of Faith, uh, where we acknowledge our one only God and our one only uh, faith and salvation in him. So I ask you, what do you believe? We confess and acknowledge one only God, to whom only we must cleave, whom only we must serve, whom only we must worship, and in whom only we must put our trust. We believe that God, after the fearful and horrible defection of man from his obedience, did seek Adam again, call upon him, rebuke his sin, convict him of the same, and in the end made unto him a most joyful promise that the seed of the woman should crush the serpent's head. We believe that our Lord Jesus offered himself a voluntary sacrifice unto his Father for us, that he, being the clean, innocent Lamb of God, was damned in the presence of an earthly judge, that we should be absolved before the tribunal seat of God. As we willingly give all honor and glory to God for our creation and redemption, so do we also for our regeneration and sanctification. For he who began a good work in us is only he who continues in us the same to the praise and glory of his undeserved grace. Amen. You may be seated. As we celebrate in a special way this Sunday that Christ was raised for our justification uh, so we are uh, emboldened in a special way uh, to confess those very sins which he has put to death, that he has nailed to the cross. And so I invite you to join with me in our corporate prayer of confession found in your order of worship as we confess our sins uh, to God. Let's go to God in prayer. Almighty God, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, we confess that we are unworthy of your redeeming grace. We have not believed your promises, nor trusted in you alone. Our eyes have strayed from you. Our hearts have not burned within us as we have heard your word. We have not trusted your redeeming power. We have been overcome with evil. In penitence, we come to you asking your forgiveness. Mercifully grant us forgiveness from all our sins and restore to us the joy of salvation for the sake of Christ, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Hear now these words of assurance of the pardon of our sin that we have coming from Paul's letter to Titus. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Our hope, our assurance is that the goodness and the loving kindness of God our Savior has appeared in Christ, and he has risen indeed. In response to this hope, this sure and certain hope that we have, let's stand and sing hymn 274, Thine Be the Glory.
Please be seated. For our scripture reading this week, we're going to take a brief break from reading through Isaiah, which has a lot of talk of the coming of Jesus and the suffering of Jesus. And we're going to take a time to talk, to read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 28, where Paul extols on the resurrection of Jesus and the meaning for it. What does it mean if Christ wasn't resurrected? And then what does it mean if Christ was resurrected? If you want to follow along in the Blue Church Bible, you'll find it on page 961. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. The word of the Lord. I invite the ushers forward as we continue to worship with the giving of our tithes and our offerings.
go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. Uh, and all we can do is give praise to you for your wonderful works, especially for the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We render unto you these tithes and these offerings as a small way to show how thankful we are that you have brought us from darkness to light. Now we pray, O oh God, that through these gifts that you, O oh God, would spread the light of your gospel to the ends of the earth and to the praise of your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. For this Sunday, we will take a, uh, a pause on our uh, walk through the Psalter to frame our prayers of intercession, and instead we will focus on the theme of resurrection and its uh, implications uh, for uh, our lives and uh, the petitions uh, that we lift up to our God. So let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we lift up our voices in praise this morning uh, to you on account of your wonderful works. Most especially, we praise you, O God, that you raised uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ from the dead and for our justification. We thank you that in his death we too have died to sin, and as he has been raised to new life, so we too have been raised to new life. We pray that you would give us the grace and encouragement we need to put off the old man, the old life that was subject to sin, and to put on the new man, the new life in Christ that is free from the dominion of sin and the devil, free from lifelong slavery to the fear of death. As you have justified us in Christ Jesus, in whom we have believed, would you also continue to sanctify us as a work of your free grace, forming us more and more each day into your image by putting to death sin in ourselves and cultivating righteousness in thoughts, affections, and actions. Father, we pray also that you would be faithful to bring a completion or bring to completion this good work of salvation in us and in your good timing. As we have been justified in Christ, may we also be glorified in him. Preserve us, we pray, through trials and temptations. Strengthen us, we ask, through suffering, until we are called home or Christ comes again. Father, we know that Christ has been raised as the first fruits of the new creation. We know that you are reconciling all things to yourself through him, whether on earth or in heaven. We know that through Christ there will be a renewal of all things, and so we confess that while we do not yet see all things in subjection to him, he is nevertheless at work, bringing to nothing all that opposes him with death, the final enemy, to be destroyed at his second coming. Therefore, we pray, O Father, in the meantime, for the civil authorities. We pray that they would govern justly, protecting the rights of the citizens, especially so that we might be able to live quiet and peaceful lives, godly and dignified in every way. We pray personally for the civil authorities that they would not only operate from your common and restraining grace, but they would also know your special grace, that they would know and confess the surpassing worth of Christ Jesus and him crucified. For those civil authorities who do follow Christ, would you give them boldness to serve and to govern with conviction, not double-minded or fearful of man, but in the strength and, sec and security of their identity in Christ. We pray also, God, that as we have opportunity and peace and stability to proclaim the gospel, that we would make much of that privilege. Would you give us boldness pr to proclaim the gospel to family, friends, neighbors, and co-workers, that we would be faithful witnesses to the truth, lights in this world, and salt to this earth. And would you, O oh Lord, give the growth. Would you bring reformation and revival in our land, convicting the hearts of backsliders that they might turn to you, their first love? Would you also convert the hearts of unbelievers that they might be brought from spiritual death to eternal life in Christ? Father, we pray for those missionaries whom you have called to and sent to the ends of the earth to proclaim your gospel to every nation from all tribes and peoples and languages. Would they carry the name and the power of the risen Lord to lost souls who have exchanged your truth for a lie? Would you go before them, preparing the way that your gospel might be gladly received? Would you work by your spirit 
along with your word, to turn the world upside down, O God. And would you give strength to your servants to go forth as missionaries who seek to persevere to the end and all to the praise of your glorious grace. And Father, would you stir in our own hearts a greater desire to know you and to worship you, even and especially as we hear your word, as it is read and preached. Would you attend to the reading and the preaching of your word that Christ might come alive to us more and more each day, and especially even now. And as long as there is a day called today, would we strive and call others to strive to enter the rest that Christ has accomplished through his suffering, death, and resurrection. It's in his name we pray these things. Amen. I invite you to turn to John chapter 20. After a long walk through the suffering and death of our Lord and Savior, we come now to this account, not strictly of his resurrection, uh, but of the aftermath of his resurrection. If you're following along in the Blue Church Bible, you can find this beginning on page 906. We'll read verses 1 through 18 of John chapter 20. Hear now the reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where. Tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for this, uh, this picture of the aftermath of the resurrection of our Savior. Would we uh, consider deeply and thoughtfully uh, the implications that Jesus is alive, not dead. And we pray that you would do this uh, through your word and by your spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. In C.S. Lewis's book, The Magician's Nephew, the two characters, Diggory and Polly, are magically transported to a place called the Wood Between the Worlds. This magical place had similarities to and connections with Earth, but it was an altogether strange place compared to what they knew. This is how Lewis describes it. The trees grew close together and were so leafy that Diggory could, not, uh, could get no glimpse of the sky. All the light was green that came through the leaves. 
but there must have been a very strong sun overhead for this green daylight was bright and warm. It was the quietest wood you could possibly imagine. There were no birds, no insects, no animals, and no wind. You could almost feel the trees growing. This wood was very much alive. When he tried to describe it afterwards, Diggory always said, it was a rich place, as rich as plum cake. Now this wood between the worlds was certainly an enchanted place that gave Diggory an almost forgetful contentment with life. It was the kind of place in which time was not so oppressive as it is in our own little square of the world. Surely, that also played into the richness of the place. Well, in our text this morning, we do not have a wood between the worlds, but we certainly have a rich place being described to us by John. In fact, that even in the way in which he describes it, there's a certain richness about it. There's a lot of very specific details, including who wins the race between him and John and, and Peter. But then there's still mysteriousness around this, uh, this description of that first Easter morning as well. We don't know exactly how all of the pieces fit together. Why does Mary stay by the tomb? Why is she only looking in after John and Peter have left? That adds a level of mysteriousness uh, to what's going on here as well. So we have a rich place described in our text, but rather than a wood between the worlds, perhaps we could call what we have in our text a garden between the ages. A garden between the ages. Let me explain what I mean by that. The one age, the old age, we could say, is the one that Peter calls this present evil age. And it is surely represented by the fact that there is a tomb in this garden. As John pointed out in our text last week, when we looked at the burial of Jesus, this garden tomb is surely meant to bring us back to the Garden of Eden. But a tomb in a garden when we're thinking about the Garden of Eden, is a foreign intruder. It should not be there. It stands as a symbol of this present evil age, the problem of this world that everyone seeks to find a solution to, regardless of whether you look to Jesus or not. The other age, which we should call the age of the Spirit in light of what happens after Easter Sunday, particularly on Pentecost, is, rent, is, is represented by the very emptiness of this tomb in this garden. For that emptiness, it signals to us that the foreign intruder into the garden of God has not been victorious after all. Death could not contain or even retain the Son of God. In this way, the garden in which the narrative of our text takes place is between two ages, that old age, the present evil age, and the new age, the age of the Spirit. Even more than that, we should note here that John's purposeful notation of time in verse 1 actually reminds us that while this garden lies between two ages, it is decidedly not balanced but very much tilted towards the age to come. I want you to look at verse 1 here, and eventually I will get to a main idea, I promise. Look at verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early. When you think about how you're going to reckon time, I think we've got a couple options, a couple main options for how we reckon time. You can... You can measure time based on a significant event, uh, or you can reckon time based on a standard. Now, I think you could make a good argument that Jesus' death is such a significant event that it should overshadow any other method of reckoning time. I mean, after all, Jesus himself, he consistently spoke of rising on the third day, 
which is a way of counting inclusively. And based on that argument, we might expect John to begin verse 1 by saying, on the third day, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early. But of course, that's not at all what we have written in this verse. Instead, John reckons time based on a standard. In this case, of course, the standard is the regular week. Therefore, he wrote, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb. What's the significance of this? Well, in the first place, it highlights the newness of what's about to happen by focusing on a fresh start, on the first day of a new week. And I mean, after such a hard week that everybody would have had who followed Christ, a a fresh start isn't a bad thing. More importantly, however, it beckons us once more to place this whole interaction in the framework of Genesis, and particularly the first seven days in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. Since, after all, the creation week is the paradigm for how the standard then applies to our, uh, our weekly lives. Coupled with the garden imagery that we've already mentioned here, we are really thrust, as John describes time and reckons time according to this standard, into the paradigm of creation and recreation. What that tells us, that this garden between the ages is launching us decidedly away from this present evil age and into the age of the Spirit. All the more so then, this garden between the ages was a rich place because it signified something rich, not only that in its imagery, but exactly what was happening it was rich indeed. Before we move on, let me just be clear about what it means to be launched toward the age of the Spirit, because we might have this notion that the Spirit means that everything is all just up here, and maybe doesn't pertain to our everyday lives. But this age of the spirit, this new age that collides with the old one in this garden cannot merely be spiritual precisely because Christ himself is the full realization. He's the first fruits, rather, of the full realization of the age of the spirit. And he decidedly has a body because it's not currently deposited in that tomb. He was not raised apart from a body, but in fact with a resurrection body, and that he can tell Mary, and we'll get to this, try to crack this nut when we get to it later, but when he says to her, don't cling to me, at least we can take away from that the fact that he has a body that could be clung to. There was continuity between his body in the grave and his body out of the grave, and it is on account of this then that Paul, as we've uh, already kind of discussed uh, through the first reading, gives us assurance that the resurrection body that Jesus has is the paradigm then for us as well who follow Christ. The resurrected Lord stands then as living proof that there is a new reality that is, that is material, it is concrete, a new creation in the dawning of this new age of the Spirit, one that is absolutely more than psychological and certainly more than spiritual. For those who are in Christ Jesus, this, of course, changes everything. If I may, it is kind of like how you look at pictures of an island vacation rental in one of two ways. One way is you look at it and you say, wow, wouldn't it be really nice to go there? And the other way is, I've already booked it, and then I look at it and I say, there's my future destination. Changes everything, whether you've booked the vacation or not. The island vacation is not a mindset when you've booked it. It's a real, attainable, material, future destination. And that changes everything about how you go about your week leading up to getting on that flight, doesn't it? Dear brothers and sisters, your holiday, as it were, in the new heavens and the new earth is booked. It is not a mindset, a mere inspirational ideal that we celebrate this morning. It is, in fact, a real, attainable, and material future destination for all those who are in Christ. 
Your holy holiday has started, though. Spiritually, yes, now, but that is not nearly the end of it, the extent of it. But indeed does start now because of this garden between the ages, for Christ is alive and not dead. And that then means that it has everything to do not only with the future destination, but our present reality today. It changes everything about the way that you deal with disappointment, depression, dysphoria, disaster, dysfunctional relationships, the devil, difficult besetting sins, disease, and so on. That is what we are celebrating here, the richness of a garden between the ages that has a real impact today. And so when we read John's account of what happened in this garden, let's read the richness of it today, impacting us today. So here's my main idea. My main idea is this, Christ Jesus is alive, not dead, and that changes everything. Christ Jesus is alive, not dead, and that changes everything. Now to develop this idea, we're not going to walk through our text verse by verse, but we're going to gather up its teaching into three aspects of this richness, this is, that is to say the life-giving and, and life-changing consequences that Jesus Christ is alive and not dead. So first of all, Christ's resurrection, that he is alive and not dead, it brings a new faith. It brings a new faith. We need to jump here to verses 8 and 9. We'll, we'll circle back, don't worry. But as you look at verses 8 and 9 here in our text, note that Peter and John, after they, they have their foot race, in response to Mary's uh, alarming announcement that there's a mystery of the missing body of Jesus, they come then to the tomb, and what do they see? They see grave clothes without a body in them. They see a face cloth that wears the marks of careful attention on it. What they did not see then is evidence of grave robbers or foul play. Taking these bits of evidence then together, John himself writes self-consciously, remarking that the result of his look into this empty grave was faith. Now, in order for that to really make sense, especially in light of what he says in verse 9 about uh, yet not yet understanding what the scriptures have to say, I must, I have to go into, into grammar. I have to remind you that Greek grammar is not like English grammar. English grammar emphasizes time. Remember that whole oppressiveness of time that we talked about that didn't exist in the garden. It doesn't exist in Greek grammar either, to a degree. To say that, that John believed, you can also say, it's just as reasonable to say that he began to believe. It doesn't do any violence to the Greek grammar here. At the same time, the word translated in verse 9, for, could be translated as though or although. And, and here's the net impact of it. If we translate verses 8 and 9 together with, with these slight differences than what we see, at least in the ESV. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in and he saw and began to believe. Though as yet, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Here's the point. John began to believe something based on what he saw, but then he also acknowledges that he, also, he, he needed some help in his unbelief to be fully certain or to fully re, you know, be able to wrap his mind around what it was that he was believing. Herman Ritterboss says it this way. He does not define his faith. It was like a new certainty that took hold of this disciple while understanding was still lacking. And yet, while the development of faith would have to come later, there's a real sense in which John believed something new on Easter Sunday precisely because something new had happened. And don't forget that John's already believed something. 
So this has to be a new faith here. Such that Christ's resurrection brings a new faith. Because it indicates everything he had said and done, or because it vindicates everything that he had said and done in his earthly ministry. John then was a step closer than Joseph and Nicodemus, as we saw last, uh, um, last week, to a full faith in the risen Lord. And yet was still in the process of being able to articulate or confess that faith himself. So this new faith, based on something new that has happened, it is very much noteworthy in John's gospel. I haven't made much of it as we've gone through, but faith has somewhat of mixed results in John's gospel. Let me just give you one example. In John chapter 6, after Jesus feeds the 5,000, he then says something that kind of unsettles a, a, a good number of people. Where he says, I am the living bread came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And it's at that point that those who had believed and had been following Jesus stopped following him. Their faith was maybe what we could call a historical faith. It needed something new, like the power of bringing life out of death. And as John looked into the empty tomb, he saw a new faith based on the resurrecting power that he beheld in seeing emptiness. So in that sense then, that Christ is alive, not dead, it really does change everything because it brings a new faith that, that has to move from just noting that these things are true uh, to acts of faith. The risen Lord... He brings a new faith in the sense that all the promises of God, because the tomb is empty, are now yes, are tangibly proven to be yes in him. He is not merely a prophet sent to inspire us. He is far more than the king of the Jews, though though not less than that. He is the very son of Eve, And Abraham and David, who had come to save his people from their sins. There is not now another to be looked for. The Lord Jesus testifies, especially in his resurrection, that he himself is that sure and certain and only hope that in death and in life, he holds the power of both and has conquered death. Now, if that doesn't change everything. I don't know what could, what possibly could. If we can take a brief takeaway on this, a new faith based on this new work that happens in this empty tomb in the midst of a garden between the ages is that we have to read all of the scriptures in an entirely new way because Jesus is alive, not dead. Second, Christ's resurrection brings a new relationship. Christ's resurrection brings a new relationship. With this, I want to go back to the beginning here and reflect on Mary Magdalene's important role in this resurrection narrative. We need to first appreciate her deep devotion to Jesus as we see in the first two verses of this chapter. More or less, as you look at those verses, what, what what we see here is that as soon as she practically could, she went to visit Jesus' tomb. And the distress that she experiences when she sees that the stone is rolled away is heartbreaking. Whomever she meant by they, as she goes to Peter and John, her primary concern here is that the body of her Lord had been moved from its resting place in this borrowed tomb. And likely she went to Peter and John as leading disciples who could help solve this grievous mystery for her. Now, after Peter and John, after they've raced to the tomb, after they've seen the evidence, after they've believed, and after they've gone back home, then in verse 11, John tells us that Mary remained behind. 
And of course, due to the compressed nature of this narrative, we don't know exactly uh, how it is that Peter and John interacted, if, if at all, with Mary um, in this time. But nevertheless, John tells us in verse 11 that Mary again was, as she was at the tomb. And this time, rather than noting a rolled away stone, she stoops down and actually looks in. You know, to her credit, remember that it was still dark when she went. So not like she would have been able to see in there. She didn't have her mag light to be able to see inside, right? But now the light is enough. She looks in, and what does she see? She sees angels. She has a decidedly different experience of an empty tomb than Peter and John did. As I mentioned in my reflection, however, it's kind of curious that she's not at all overcome by fear in the sight of them, as was so often the case when angels, especially angels appearing in white, uh, would manifest themselves before mere mortals. That's some some of the strangeness of what's going on in this garden between the ages. She kind of just looks at them and and treats them just like normal people. Uh, But this is, (laughs) in no category can this be called a normal experience. Either way, these angels, they ask her why she's weeping. And note that she, she tells them exactly what she's already said to Peter and John. It's her same concern over again. And now a new audience has asked her what her concern is. And so she gives it to them. She doesn't know where the body of her Lord is. Now again, this is quite amazing and surprising to us. She just casually interrupts this conversation with celestial beings in verse 14. She's, I, we can assume she sensed that someone was coming up behind her. Of course, John doesn't leave us readers in, dis, in, in suspense as to who she is. We know that it is Jesus, but Mary doesn't recognize him. Again, this is now the third time Jesus, uh, Mary is asked why she's weeping. Now also whom she is seeking. And once more, again, supposing that Jesus is the gardener, Remarkably, she continues to, to dog on her one concern. Where is the body of my Lord? Now just imagine here, if you could be a little fly on the wall. It, it's somewhat ironic and I think also humorous that she's asking Jesus where his body is. <laughs> and it's right there. <laughs> we, we shouldn't let that humor uh, escape our notice in this situation. Uh, it's, a, it's a poignant moment, and this, this humor also, uh, so in somewhat, in, to some degree, kind of helps us to appreciate the tenderness also of what's going on here. True confessions, I'm one of those suckers for those videos of returning soldiers come back from deployment, and they, they surprise their wives, their children, they show up in unexpected times and places. And there's always this initial moment of confusion of uncertainty that comes across the face of the one who's being surprised, and that gets me. Because the thought in the back of the mind is, how could it possibly be that my person is home from deployment? And all the categories that the person has are just blown up. For whatever reason, Mary is also in a very similar kind of place And then for many deeper reasons, she has zero categories for what's going on here as she turns and and supposes it's merely the gardener. Because after all, the category of person who was violently put to death but is raised from the dead and looks okay is not one of those categories that we all usually have in our back pocket, is it? But then it's just as moving. That Jesus causes Mary to recognize him simply by saying her name. Whatever the reason that she didn't recognize him, her mascara was in her eyes, whatever it might be. He veiled himself for, for redemptive historical reasons. Whatever the reason might be, it is infallibly cleared away with one personal word. This is deep. Because what that reminds us of is what Jesus has already said would happen in his ministry. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. 
As Mary hears the good shepherd call her by name, she turns and she greets him, not with a special devotion, but we should note three times now she's been caring about where he is. She greets him with a consistent devotion that she's always had to her Lord. Now I want to just make one point about Mary's turning. I want you to note that word turning because she turns twice. In, our, in the short uh, uh, section between verses 14, 15, and 16. And we should get the impression here that Mary is engaged here, actually not just cutting off the angels, but somewhat kind of engaged with the angels and with the gardener, in quotes, here. She's kind of caught halfway between them, and it is only when Jesus calls her by name that we get the resolution uh, to her dividedness between the empty tomb and the one she's been looking for this whole time. Now this back and forth, using this word turning, it, it's actually, this word turning is actually a word that has an, uh, undertones of, of a kind of inward change or conversion. It's used negatively for those who won't be converted in John 12.40. And all of this speaks of something, to something of Mary's own new faith, as she now is prompted by Jesus' personal call to her. And it marks a new relationship as well that she now has with him. He calls her. She recognizes him. But there's a new relationship between them than there was before. Mary's response in recognizing Jesus probably included falling at his feet and kind of you know, leg tackling him, ankle tackling him, right? In response to that, Jesus says to her in verse 17, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Now, I don't want to wade into all of the interpretive quagmire that we could about what does it mean, do not cling to me, when he's, uh, when he's going to tell um, Thomas in a, in a few verses here to, you know, shove his hand in his side. You know, why he's not, it's not that he, he's misogynist, okay? Let's just start there. But without wading into all of that, I would simply say this. We've already seen three times how Mary is desperately concerned about finding her Lord. His body is just him, right? Finding her Lord. She found him, or he found her, right? And now she's in possession of it, as it were, his, his, him, She's not going to let go. Would you? Don't, you don't, don't cling to me. You can kind of see, and I wrote this as part of the, uh, the reflection as well. It's more or less along the lines of, you don't need to be concerned that I'm going anywhere anytime soon. It's not a rebuke, that is to say. It's a reassurance to Mary that she has been greatly rewarded for her devotion to her Lord. She's fundamentally changed in her relationship, however, in that she now has to be told that there is a little bit of distance between them. For Jesus is not the same as he was when he went in the tomb. It's not that he is untouchable. It's that he's so exalted now that, that that relationship necessarily has to be different. We, see, we detect a little bit of that in the message he gives her, of course, in, at the end of verse 17, that it's my God and your God, my Father and your Father. There's a little bit of separation there. He doesn't use our. He doesn't tell them he's our Father, our God. He's my God and your God, my Father and your Father. That he's alive and not dead actually does change everything, including our relationship to him. That we treat him with a, a tremendous level of respect for what he has done for us, yet also can still come to him because of what he has done for us. And in fact, this new relationship is, is ultimately far better 
because now endowed with all authority and power, when we cling to Christ, as it were, through our prayers, that relationship is now not worrying about, well, is he just going to go get hung on a cross again? No, now we pray to him in the power of his resurrection, in the power of his victory. Death can't conquer him. No concern that we bring to him can overcome him. A new relationship in this garden between the ages. Let me finally and, and hopefully briefly uh, address one last thing, and it's Christ's new message. His, his resurrection brings a new message. We see here that after he reveals himself to Mary, he gives her, uh, amazingly, something of an apostolic commission. And I mean that to kind of press you and make you feel a little uncomfortable. Because she's privileged with being the first apostle, as it were, of the, of the resurrection. To the other disciples, to, the, to especially the twelve. She is given the message to bring to the ones then who would be the firm foundation through the, the apostles and the prophets of the church, ultimately. She is rewarded greatly for her devotion in this respect. But let's not forget that what she's given is a message to deliver. And that message is a very important message. It is a message ultimately of our union in Christ and our communion with God that come as a result of this what's happened in this garden between the ages. For first, Jesus says to go to my brothers. And for as great the gap is between the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ and us. How amazing is it that he would still be willing to call them my brothers. They abandoned him. Nobody was there. Nicodemus and Joseph were the ones who put him in the grave. Where were the rest of the disciples? They were hiding in fear and would continue to do that by the way. And we'll see as we continue on. And yet, the message he proclaims is not, well, pull yourselves up by your bootstraps, grow up and figure it out. But he says to Mary, go to my brothers and give them this message. The place of his followers in his kingdom is those who are, in fact, first of all, included in that kingdom as part of that family and are united to him so that while there is a distinction our relationship is not one of peers we are nevertheless co-heirs of the promises of God in him insofar as we are united to him that then we can in fact call God our father and our God because we are united to the one who has made it, it possible. Therefore, we also have, as a related idea, a restored communion with God through Christ's better and new covenant. And all of this, this message of our union in Christ and our communion with God, Mary gets to declare, and she can say to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, which is another way of saying Jesus is alive, not dead. And that puts a punctuation mark on Jesus' own final word then from the cross and gives deep significance to what at least John would have heard when he declared, it is finished. Indeed it is. Because not even death can conquer him. He has been vindicated then in his resurrection. And as we sung last week in our weird out-of-order Palm Sunday, but also Jesus' death, we can also declare that all glory, laud, and honor goes to our Redeemer King because it is finished. And how do you know it's finished? Because the tomb is empty. And that's the message then that Mary brings to the disciples. 
I have seen the Lord. And that changes everything. For right now, today, you and I are living in this new age. It started in this garden. We are inheritors of this new faith based on this new message, empowered by our new relationship with the Lord. And that changes everything about how we conduct our lives in this world, how we engage with family, friends, neighbors, and coworkers, how we read the newspaper, how we face opposition, Our hope is a living hope because our Savior is a living Savior, not a mindset, not an inspirational ideal to get through the tough times in our lives, but a living hope and a living Savior, which we receive in this new message. So then, may we take up this new message for the strength the stability of the new faith that we receive, grounded on this new relationship with Christ. And may God get all the glory. Let's go to him in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for this this testimony uh, that Christ is alive and not dead. Uh, Would we, in light of it, uh, be empowered uh, by your Spirit uh, to serve, to live and serve uh, you? It's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing our hymn of response, which is also a hymn of preparation, hymn 200, or rather 426, Till He Come. Please stand as we sing. Please be seated. The truth is that our celebration of Resurrection uh, uh, Sunday can sometimes be difficult. We can have burdens in our lives. We can be struggling with the weight of sin. Uh, We can be Uh, wearied by this fallen world, and it's entirely possible that as we go through this service, maybe you've been going through the motions. What we confess and what we believe here, however, 
is the only and a potent antidote to the weariness, the weightiness that we experience in this fallen world. For our hope is not a present one, a purely present one. Our hope is one, as we have just sung, that he will come. And that in this intervening period, till he come, he has not abandoned us. But he has indeed given us what we need. He has given us his word. He has given us his sacraments to strengthen us, to equip us, to prepare us. Not that we would just barely scrape by until he come, but indeed that we would by faith take hold of his promises and the present reality now through his word and the sacraments that he provides to us. Christ instituted this sacrament of the Lord's Supper to be a balm and a strength for those who have placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to continue not in in weakness to get by by the skin of your teeth till he come, but to be strengthened by his eternal power till he come. What we have here is a sign that signifies to us that he is alive and not dead and has therefore, out of the graciousness and the abundance of his victory over sin, death, and the devil, now provides himself to strengthen us. And as the message that he declared to Mary Magdalene to then give to the disciples, to declare to the entire world, is that we are united to him and therefore can call God our Father as well. So we are spiritually united to him in our taking of this bread and of this wine. That we then need not be afraid to say that his flesh is life to us as we feed by faith at this table. For we know that we are spiritually nourished by Christ as, is, as, it is, as his body is signified to us and it is sealed to us as we partake at this table. Therefore, Christ invites all those who have confessed faith in him, been baptized into his church, and admitted to this table by the elders of their respective uh, congregations then to come and to taste and see just how good he is. That invitation is extended now. If, however, you have not confessed faith in Christ, not been admitted to this table yet, let these elements pass you by, but consider the real, tangible power of God in Christ who is risen. Speak to me or one of the other elders. If you would like to know more about the gospel, we would be delighted to declare it to you. We do use wine in the celebration of the Lord's Supper. If for reasons of diet or conscience, you prefer juice, you can find it in the outer rings of the drink trays. And if you require gluten-free bread, you'll find it in small bags in the bread trays. And if you have any questions, please ask the elders as they distribute. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, that we can freely come to this table uh, because you, O God, have loosened the chains of sin from us, that we might then come to you uh, by your grace, to receive Christ by your grace and be strengthened then to proclaim Christ by your grace. Pray, O oh God, that you would now uh, enable us to uh, receive him by faith in this sacrament together as the body of Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.
On the night of the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. And he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you once more. Uh, that we can come to you in prayer at all uh, because Christ has made a way through his body for us to come and to find grace and help in time of need before your throne. Would you, O oh God, strengthen us in Christ, our risen Lord. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, as, as is our custom... <coughs> Excuse me. As is our custom on uh, Fifth Sundays... Uh, we will take up a deacon's fund offering uh, to, uh, uh, to build up our reserves of our diaconal ministry in order to uh, support the needs of this church and then uh, those in our uh, community. Can I invite the deacons uh, to come forward uh, to take up this offering?
And please stand as we sing our final hymn, hymn 263, Lift High the Cross. may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I do want to highlight just a couple announcements here uh, before you are dismissed. First of all, I want to give a, a, a deep thanks uh, to all those who, who sang uh, today and on Good Friday and also on Palm Sunday, especially to Betsy and Amelia for their work in organizing all of it. Um, it is truly a blessing to have such talent. Uh, it is a delight uh, to hear it used to the glory of God. And so 
uh, though you know we're good Presbyterians and don't clap in the service, now is the appropriate time to clap and give thanks. For that. Uh, the only other thing I want to highlight is that uh, we had a great breakfast uh, this morning, and uh, you know, believe it or not, you can come back next Sunday at 9:15, and you can be fed not breakfast uh, but a meaty theological meal. <laughs> now, hopefully, I'm not overselling it, uh, but I am particularly excited uh, for the opportunity, at least, uh, to begin a short series between uh, next week and and uh, more or less. Memorial Day uh, weekend uh, on the doctrine of revelation. That is, you know, God reveals himself to us. How does he do it? What is all related uh, in, in that? How does a, a God who is not us speak to us? Uh, lots of different things for us to think about in that regard. I think it'd be really helpful. And I am convinced, at least, it has a lot to, to say to our current moment in this world. And so I'd encourage you uh, to to get up, to come to church, bring your breakfast if you want, <laughs> uh, but come and, uh, and enjoy our, our upcoming uh, s uh, Sunday School series on the doctrine of Revelation. And then, of course, you can see all the information for the men's and women's Bible studies. This is a fifth Wednesday, however, I believe, uh, or maybe not. I don't know what it is, but somebody's going to meet this week or not. <laughs> it's, it's the first week of April. Is it really? Yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah, so I guess that's us, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. Don't listen to me when it comes to schedules, <laughs> except for Sunday school. It is going to start <laughs> next Sunday. Uh, all right. So you are dismissed. Thank you.